Friday, May 40 here. Long, detailed article in the New York Times. Very troubling information about Deshaun Watson, the Houston Texans quarterback. He was going to unlicensed massage therapists. And guys, if you're going to get a massage, make sure that your massage therapist is fully licensed. Over to Tucker Carlson. Good evening. Welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson Tonight, Happy Tuesday. It was six years ago in one of those semi-hilarious moments that has unfortunately been lost to history that Janet Yellen sat through what must have been the single most uncomfortable congressional hearing of her life. At the time, you may remember, Yellen was running the Federal Reserve and she was, as she remains today, a lifestyle liberal in good standing. So put yourself in her position and imagine the shock she must have felt when members of the Congressional Black Caucus suggested that she, Janet Yellen, was in fact a racist, maybe even a white supremacist. What did Janet Yellen do wrong? Well, they suggested what she did wrong was she failed to harness the power of the Federal Reserve to help African Americans specifically. Now, at first, Yellen seemed confused by this complaint. The point of the Fed is to keep the American economy stable. The point is not to pay off loyal blocks of Democratic voters. And she tried to explain this. Our powers, she said, can't be targeted at the experience of particular groups. That was her response. But the Congressional Black Caucus did not buy it. Their message to Janet Yellen was the same as their message to you and every other person in this country of 350 million people. Do what we say, or we will denounce you as a racist. And finally, Janet Yellen got that message. Boy, did she. Within a year, Yellen had all but abandoned the traditional constraints of monetary policy. Instead, there she was yammering on in public about things like racial equity and environmental justice. Now, those are issues that, unlike economics, cannot be quantified or even specifically defined. They are therefore perfect vehicles for power-hungry politicians hoping to become more powerful. Now, Yellen was supposedly an economist, but as she turned 70, she left the field of economics completely and entered the far more familiar world of political activism. By the time she became Joe Biden's Treasury Secretary, the transformation was complete. Among Yellen's first acts as Treasury Secretary was an order changing the mission of the Treasury Department's Financial Stability Oversight Council. Now, that council was created by Congress after the last financial crisis, as its name suggests, to prevent something similar from ever happening again. And for about a decade, it focused on questions that might prevent another meltdown. Questions like subprime lending and automated trading on Wall Street. Relevant questions. But under Janet Yellen, the council turned its attention to a far more fashionable issue that she was consumed with. Global warming! Quote, We must look ahead at emerging risks, Yellen proclaimed. Climate change is obviously the big one. She sent a letter to the World Bank telling them the same thing. As for inflation, which traditionally was a core concern of government economists, that was the emerging risk they were worried about. Yellen just shrugged that off. Inflation? If that happens, she told us in a now famous quote, it'll be, quote, transitory. In the history of bad predictions from Washington, which could fill volumes, that might take first place. In fact, since Joe Biden became president, the price of gasoline has doubled. And so have the prices of many other key commodities that Americans need to live. And the worst part is that not only did Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, fail to see any of this coming, Janet Yellen, more than any other single person in America, caused it in the first place through reckless loose money policies implemented during her years at the Fed, policies that were bound to cause inflation, and did. So if you're mad about the current state of the economy, Janet Yellen is probably the first person you should blame. Why does she still have her job? It's a good question. And we might have heard an answer to that because Yellen was back in front of Congress today. But this time, there were no tough interrogatories from the Congressional Black Caucus. No one called her a racist. Instead, they kissed up to her. As Yellen explained to a deeply sympathetic room of members of Congress, the real problem with the American economy is that she and the Democratic Party don't yet have enough control over it. Watch. Look, over the medium term, the critical thing is that we become more dependent on the wind and the sun that are not subject to geopolitical influences and passing clean um, energy credits that will boost um, non-renewables is, I think, really, really critical to... um, to, to, to addressing climate change and our uh, energy costs for households well, going Madam forward. Secretary, my- 
So just for fun, if you have five minutes, rewind the tape, transcribe what she just said, and see if you can make sense of the verbal bully base. What are you looking at? It's called intersectionalism. It's the new religion of government. And it allows bureaucrats, when it becomes clear they have no idea what they're doing, to just pivot and talk about something they know even less about. So here you have Janet Yellen talking about geopolitical influences, clean energy credits, climate change. What is Janet Yellen talking about? Well, she has no idea. The problem is that there are people out there who actually do understand what she's trying to talk about. Experts, actual experts, have studied the sustainability of renewable energy for years. Michael Schellenberger, for example, found that from 2011 to 2017, the cost of solar panels dropped by more than 70% in this country. There are more of them. It's a supply and demand question. But here's the interesting part. During that same period, as the cost of solar panels fell, electricity prices in California went up five times more than they did in the rest of the United States. Why more solar panels? The solar panels were cheaper, but the electricity they produced was more expensive. Huh? How does that work, and how's it helping you? We know it happens because it happened in Germany at scale. From 2006 to 2018, that would be the heyday, the peak years of Germany's big renewable energy push, electricity prices went up 50%. Now, why'd that happen? Well, let's compare it to a neighboring country. In France, electricity prices were much lower than Germany's, even though France gets twice as much of its energy from clean energy sources as Germany does. What? What made France so special? How'd they pull that off? Simple. Nuclear. France gets a lot of its energy from nuclear power. Janet Yellen does not consider nuclear power a renewable. When she says renewable, she means wind and solar, which by definition are not reliable sources of energy, but they are, and this is always the key, highly profitable to democratic donors and the government of China. So, of course, Janet Yellen is for them. Of course, Yellen didn't go into details on why she thinks what she does, because if you unpack it, if you slow down and speak clearly, it doesn't make any sense. And Janet Yellen knows that. She's an activist. She gets that logic is irrelevant. Thinking clearly? No, that gets you nowhere. Emotion is what carries the day. And that's why, during today's congressional hearings, she started talking about yet another topic she knows nothing about. Gun crime. I am also horrified by gun violence, um, what we've seen in recent weeks over and over many years. And I do hope that Congress will take long overdue action and um, put in place common sense measures to reduce gun violence. Oh, I'm horrified about gun violence. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, you're the Treasury Secretary? Shh. Let's talk about the economy, which is imploding. Stop with your little abortion talk, your little gun talk. Not your area. Let's get back into your lane. You're the Treasury Secretary. But of course, she doesn't want to. The goal always is to talk about anything other than the economy. Why? Because they destroyed the economy. But there was one exception. At one point, Janet Yellen was asked, because it's a pretty obvious question, how exactly, as the Treasury Secretary and former Fed Chair, as an economist and a genius, how'd you miss the inflation you caused? Here it went. When I said that inflation would be transitory, what I was not anticipating was a scenario in which we would end up contending with multiple variants of COVID that would be scrambling our economy and global supply chains. And I was not envisioning um, impacts on food and energy prices we've seen from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So um, as Chair Powell indicated himself, um, both of us probably could have used a better term than transitory. I do expect inflation to remain high, although I very much hope that it will be coming down now. Oh, so you didn't see COVID coming, even though it was here for two years and we shut down the entire economy and then made up for the gap in productivity with profligate government spending, where we just printed trillions of fake dollars. But you didn't think that was going to cause inflation somehow? And you didn't think a war in the breadbasket of Europe would affect food prices? 
Let's say you were a talk show host on a cable channel with no economic experience whatsoever or even the ability to balance a checkbook, and it was obvious to you, but you're the Treasury Secretary, but you didn't see it coming? Maybe you shouldn't have called it transitory? And your answer is, and we're quoting, I do expect inflation to remain high, although I do very much hope it will be coming down. Oh, you very much hope. Is that where we are? We are very much hoping? Tell us more about abortion and gun violence, if you would. Blame COVID and Putin and call it a day. This is a joke. Fox's Hillary Vaughn, to her credit, was not convinced. She asked Janet Yellen whether Joe Biden's decision to spend trillions of dollars might have contributed to inflation. Because like, when you have more of something, it's worth less, like your currency, which is almost worth less. And here was Janet Yellen's response. Do you ever warn the White House that increased government spending could have contributed to the inflation that we're seeing today? We're just heading to the coffee. Oh, go away, peasant troll. Your inflation talk. I'm worried about climate change and gun violence and abortion. Leave me alone. It's not like the Treasury Secretary. Be gone. She should be gone. This is crazy. And in a functioning country, Janet Yellen would be in a retirement home somewhere writing her memoirs that no one would ever read. But that's not what's happening. She's still the Treasury Secretary, and that's not what happened today. Instead, Democrats took turns bragging about their expensive electric cars. Worried about gas prices? Just get a Tesla, baby. Here's Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. Well, good morning, Madam Secretary. We're so glad to have you uh, with us. I do have to say just on the issue of uh, uh, gas prices, after waiting for a long time uh, to have enough chips in this country to finally get my electric vehicle, I got it uh, and drove it from Michigan to here uh, this last weekend and went by every single gas station and didn't matter how high it was. And so I'm looking forward to the opportunity for us to move to vehicles that aren't going to be dependent on the um, whims of of the oil companies and the uh, international markets. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because electric cars don't actually use energy, so they're disconnected from the international market. Hey, Debbie Sabato, what's an international market? Do you have any idea whatsoever? Do you know anything? You're telling us that the oil companies are so greedy, they somehow canceled their own leases for drilling. They're so greedy, they don't even want to drill oil. And that's why they shut down their own pipelines. Is that right? And that's why they're talking about implementing a gas tax, because they don't want you to use oil, right? What's the reasoning here, Debbie Stabenow? Maybe we should contact Janet Yellen. Maybe she'll answer. Maybe she'll just wave us away like the peasants we are. What's going on here? How can this person be our Treasury Secretary? We're in deep waters. Is there anyone who can pull us out of them? Charlie Gasparino has spent a lot of time covering this and thinking about it. He's a senior correspondent at Fox <laughs> Business and joins us tonight. It, Charlie, I have to say, I mean, I'm making fun because I'm not really sure what the other answer is, but you think of Treasury secretaries as sober people who at least want to tackle the core problems of the American economy. Inflation is always going to be a core problem. And she waves away the question, like, out of my face, peasants? Like, what is this? It, 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 was, it was horrible. And, you know, I can't think of a more inept Treasury secretary over the past 30 years, based on you know record, just what they've done and what they haven't done, yes, than yes. Johnny Yellen, maybe Nick Brady, and I'm dating myself when I bring that right. name up, H.W. Bush, but maybe. But you know, Janet Yellen is, I mean, think of it this way, Tucker. You're Joe Biden and Janet Yellen. You, you come into office in January uh, 2021 with an 80 mile an hour fastball down the middle of the plate, and that's called the U.S. economy. And here's why, the economy was improving greatly, in, you know, people forgot this. They were all, you know, I know the election was crazy. I know January 6th was nuts. But the Trump economy was pretty damn strong, particularly as he left office. On top of that, yes. he delivered a vaccine which was effective against those first two very deadly variants. Less effective on Omicron, but it didn't matter. OK, it was basically we were coming out of the pandemic. The economy was going to improve. And he, this is what they did. They turn around and they spent trillions of dollars on nothing. And, and they expected yeah. no inflation. They encouraged J Jerome Powell to keep printing money when he didn't need to. It was the very, it was the, a textbook recipe for inflation that you have to be, listen, I have 
the equivalent of a minor in econ, and I could see it coming. Right? Yes. I mean, she's a, supposed to be a great economist, and, you know, and everything they've done since then. Um, increased regulations hurts supply. Remember, that cuts back supply. Higher taxes cuts back supply. Some of the crazy people they put in office uh, that are anti-business. Uh, environmental mandates, which prevent supply of oil. And by the way, it's not just her, it's the, the whole team. Uh, right. the, the word is that she's out after the, uh, the midterms, uh, that um, Gina Raimondo, might, the Commerce Secretary, might replace her. I mean, Gary Gensler, the SEC chair. But, you know, these are all apparatchiks that just have no clue. And, you know, the reason why, what's really bad about Janet Yellen, I think, what's really, cause she's supposed to know better. But, uh, Joe exactly. Biden came in there trying to be more transformative than Barack his old boss, Barack Obama. That means he spent. He didn't think he didn't think what he was spending on. He just spent. She should have sat there and told him, stop. She should have known better. And she obviously didn't. It's just it's it's lacking seriousness on the most basic really level. Is. And it really is. These are not adults. And uh, it makes me uncomfortable. Charlie Gasparino, I appreciate your perspective. Tonight, as always, thank you. So if you got really rich, let's just say, out of nowhere, what would you do with the money? It's a hard question. A lot of people waste it. They do nothing interesting with it. Kid Rock has been in the entertainment business and successful for like 30 years. He's taken his money and built what he calls a redneck paradise on a farm out. Okay, so let's talk about me. And uh, I've, got, I've got a confession. There's, frankly, there's nothing that I find more frightening than a masturbating man. Like if I woke up at 2 a.m. and there was like a man looming over me holding an AR-15, like I'd rather have a man, you know, looming over me with an AR-15 than, you know, looming over me with his erect cock in his hands. I mean, that's just me. I'm I'm kind of squeamish about masturbating men. I, I mean, I, I'm downright frightened. Like some some dude about to blow his load it's just frightening to me but i mean this is this is my insecurities uh you know i, I admit it this is this is work that i haven't done yet like i i really need to to grow in this area so i don't have so much anxiety but uh, i'm just trying to figure out what should i do if deshaun watson the disgraced new york uh houston texans quarterback Try, tries to book an Alexander Technique lesson from me. Like, how, how how should I deal? So, thank God, some guidance here from the New York Times, how the Texans in a spa enabled Deshaun Watson's troubling behavior. And you know what's most tr troubling about his behavior? He was getting massages from unlicensed massage therapists. I mean, how troubling is this? He was not, he was not consulting the experts. Right. He wasn't taking advantage of, you know, our government, which is on our side and trying to make sure that we only get the best of massage therapists, like massage therapists who really know the anatomy, you know, really know how to properly work the muscles. Like, you know, thank God we've got the government out there regulating our massage therapists. But this guy, he was going around Texas. He was getting massages from unlicensed therapist. I mean, I think that's outrageous. So two dozen women said that football star Deshaun Watson harassed or assaulted them during massage appointments. So two grand juries in Texas declined to charge him criminally. And the NFL is considering whether to discipline him. He's got another job, signed a five-year, $230 million fully guaranteed contract to play quarterback for the Cleveland Browns this coming season. So Deshaun Watson says it's time for everyone to move on. But I can't move on because some of these details just frighten me and I'm not sure I would know what to do. Like if someone, like, thank God my, my Alexander Technique practice, it really only appeals to the best in people. So I get these, you know, upper class elevated clients like billionaires and actresses and actors and, you know, great people like uh, Judas and and so i i just deal with the best yeah I, i'm only dealing with people seeking you know professional alexander technique but i mean what if i had a client it was like begging me to put my mouth on his penis i mean i, I just i'd find that awkward 
I mean, that would totally violate the rules of my Alexander Technique teaching profession. And just just some of the, the positions that he was putting these, these women in. So apparently there are 66 women who've had given him massages. And one woman sued Watson was a flight attendant to begin taking massage therapy classes during the pandemic. And so, but was she even licensed, bro? So they had a friendly exchange on Instagram. And so he sent her a message asking for an appointment. And like, this guy's a hero. He said, I'm just trying to support black businesses. Right? So what if, like, if someone came to me and said, look, I want an Alexander Technique lesson. I'm just trying to support black businesses. Like, I'd welcome my brother or sister. And so he, he would present himself as an ally to business women. Like he, he told her he really wanted to support black businesses and, and he, he purchased 30 bottles of a woman's $40 skin cleanser. So I haven't developed my own line of supplements or products. I mean, that that's work I still need to do. But uh, this one woman, she wasn't comfortable going to a hotel because she knew Deshaun Watson's girlfriend. She had at once babysat his girlfriend and her younger brother. So she wanted to keep things professional and respectful. So he responded, oh, most definitely always professional. I even have an NDA. I have the therapist signed too. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was going to massage someone and the person told me, oh, I have an NDA for you to sign, I mean, that would make me feel so much safer. Just knowing that I had to sign off on an NDA, I mean, that really made me feel protected. So the woman suggested they meet at her mother's home and it was a 30-minute drive. He, he said, damn, that's far, but he agreed to make the, the trip. Now, I've never had an Alexander Technique client, you know, give me directions to get up in there during a massage, but I got to think that'd be kind of awkward. And so she chalked it up to an inexperience and she agreed to work with him again. Like she was felt awkward when he told her to get up in there. Now, he ejaculated during the second appointment and then asked her for another massage later that day. And she at first agreed, then told him she could not make it. And she eventually blocked his number. But like, how would you handle it if, if you had a client for, say, your aromatherapy business, or maybe you're, you're giving people uh, CBT? Uh, what's that? CBT is like a type of therapy. Uh, I, I'm blanking. Or I don't know, maybe you're reading people's auras. And, and you just try to give like a very respectable aura reading. And then the dude just blows the load. I mean, it would freak me out. Like, thank God I only appeal to the most elevated people who don't do this kind of thing. But, I mean, I love Mexican food. Do you love Mexican food? Like, I love nachos. And, like, let's say I go to a nice shop uh, on Pico Boulevard and, and I order a nice, you know, nacho dish. And, and someone, like, in the back there wants to, you know, give me his own version of, of sour cream on top of my nachos, that would, that make me feel uncomfortable. Like, I like, you know, my finger food, but, I mean, if someone wanted to contribute on top of my nachos, I mean, even if I was able to sell them 40 bottles of my $30 a bottle cleanser, it would still weird me out. So, one woman told Watson when he booked an appointment, she was licensed only to give him a back facial. C can you tell me what a back facial is? I don't really know what a back facial is. So when he came in, he got fully undressed and directed her toward his groin. So I've never had an Alexander Technique client get fully undressed. That, that would weird me out. So she said there was no sexual contact. She believed he was seeking more than a professional massage. Man... Man, why, why can't blokes just be, be satisfied with a professional massage or, I mean, even better, a professional Alexander Technique lesson? I mean, at least you learn something in an Alexander Technique lesson that you can then take with you as, as you go into your day. So Deshaun Watson says he was only seeking massages. How about a hamburger with Swiss cheese, caramelized onions, and special sauce? <laughs> no, no, I'm going to have to decline. So he saw a physical therapist who did not sue Watson. Says, says he initiated sexual contact in all three of their appointments. So 
I, I don't know about you, but if I was giving someone an Alexander Technique lesson and he or she initiated sexual contact, I, I would not be booking lessons two and three. I mean, maybe I'm just a scaredy cat. Maybe I've got issues with anxiety. That maybe I just need to grow up. But like having having a client initiate sexual contact, like every time you book an appointment, I mean, I, I think I'd I'd get pretty tired of that after. I think I just need one, one instance of this, and then uh, no more. But for, for this woman, uh, she kept booking him, and he kept initiating sexual contact, and uh, apparently. He began aggressively dictating where he wanted her to touch him. So thank God I've never had that because when I teach the Alexander technique, I only deal with the, the most elevated people who aren't you know, directing me, you know, where I should put my hands. So in their first session, she said he got into the happy baby yoga pose. So I don't know about you. Like what, what if you're going over to hang out with a mate and he just gets into his happy baby yoga pose? I've never even heard of this. I've never had any experience with clients or non-clients or anyone like just going into happy baby yoga pose. So that means on his back with his feet in his hands. And then he asked her to massage between his testicles and anus. I I've never experienced that. No one's ever asked me to massage between their testicles and anus. I would, I think I'd feel quite uncomfortable and anxious about that. So have you had experience with people just popping into happy baby yoga pose and then asking you to massage them between the testicles and the anus? So she laughed off his request, but he grabbed her wrist and put her hand there. So she says, uh, Watson kept initiating sexual intercourse. And she said they were on friendly terms, so she let him proceed with these sex acts. I just didn't know how to tell him no. I think I know how to tell someone no. I mean, that's just me. Like someone starts initiating sex with me and I don't want to have sex. I, I mean, I think I'd say no. Now, he was very generous. Uh, one woman, he, he sent her $5,000 to buy spa equipment. And, and, uh, and said, I, I, I'll show you how to get money from men. That's my specialty. So if I had a client who came over and said, oh, I'll show you how to get money from men. That's my specialty. I think that'd make me uncomfortable. So this one woman kept uh, setting, setting him up for massages. But here's the, the most disturbing thing. None of the women that she was setting him up for massages was licensed in Texas to perform massages. So you may have like a spouse or, or a girlfriend or a friend massage you but if they're not licensed i mean that's just asking for trouble man you really really need to make sure that these these people are licensed before you allow them to perform massage so one of the women said watson begged her for oral sex i don't know about you but if a client came to me and started begging for oral sex uh, i I wouldn't have to have a lot of sessions with the with the person. Uh, I, I think I'd probably put an end to things like right there. So we tried to build up to sexual acts. So if I'm teaching the Alexander Technique lesson, the client's trying to build up to sexual acts, you know, or or he asked me to work on his behind or go higher up on his inner thighs, I would be into that. I mean, maybe I'm just some kind of old fuddy duddy. Like if a client starts exposing his erection. I'm pretty sure that would be the end of the Alexander Technique lesson. So uh, one woman told Deshaun Watson, I told him he can't treat us black women any kind of way. Well, that's telling him. So Watson asked, uh, asked one massage therapist to put her fingers inside his anus. So yeah, it wouldn't be a lot of lessons that I'd be booking for someone who asked me something like that. I mean, Kit Natividad asked me something like that once, and that was it. I mean, Kit Natividad, she she just lost out on, on any chance for some kind of fulfilling, long-term, you know, emotionally intimate relationship with me. I'm just just not into that. So in his second session, so she keeps giving him sessions. Like the first session, he, he wants her fingers inside his anus. Second session, he asks her if she wants his penis in her mouth. And he repeatedly requests sex in the third 
massage. So how many massages would you have to give a client or cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, or reading someone's aura, or you know, maybe you know, giving someone a Torah lesson and they keep requesting sex? Like how many of these sessions would you go through? For, for me, like old fuddy-duddy here, I think just the uh, first time it happened, that would be it. So apparently she knew Watson was seeking sex and she felt like she needed to keep Watson happy. Well, this is this is very troubling behavior. I mean, I, I know I would just be be freaked out. But I mean my anxiety levels would definitely go up. I, I, like Let's say I'm giving an Alexander Technique lesson and, and the client starts ejaculating. I mean, for me, that would be the end. Or let's say I'm driving an Uber, like, you know, some dude's ejaculating in the back seat. I mean, I think I would end the, end the ride there and report him. I mean, but how would you handle it if, you know, some client is just repeatedly ejaculating? I mean, what's the right way to handle a client? Like, what... Let, let's construct a vessel for a safe place to have, have this kind of awkward conversation. I mean, I'm thinking about all the aura readers and aromatherapists out there who just want to do the right thing, and they're just getting pestered for sex. I mean, let's say you just want to sell someone carpet or measure their drapes, or maybe you just want to talk to some bloke about Jesus, and he's flogging himself like a banshee. Uh, to me, there's just nothing more frightening than a masturbating man. Because, yeah, the, you know, the man with the body armor and the AR-15, sure, he can, he can destroy my body. But the, the radioactive seed of, of, of a man could tarnish my soul for all eternity. Like, I, I'm a very respectable man. Like, people look up to me. People have, have so much respect for me. I, I, was, I was Hustler Magazine's asshole of the month. I, I'm, a, I'm a beacon of respectable journalism in an age of, of clickbait. And, and like to have a client who just keeps ejaculating just me it would take like 14 lessons 14 sessions before i i decide that uh, this is not really a client for me free of new york city um where it was uh you know basically becoming extremely expensive but it was also becoming kind of like the capital of the world and blah 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 and history as well um but by, I mean, I remember visiting New York City when I was maybe like just out of high school or something. And I just could not believe the change because I, um, my parents, and I think another family was with us. And we went to New York City for Thanksgiving in, let's say like 1987 or something. And we like went to Phantom of the Opera on Broadway and the Museum of Art. You know, it was very touristy stuff. But it was a really fun, you know, kind of like three day weekend or something. And I, I remembered it distinctly. I remember being in Times Square. And it was like a scene out of Eyes Wide Shut. Like the prostitutes, and you know, I was probably, because I was born in 1978. So I was, probably, let's say nine, 10, something like that. And the prostitutes were dressed like prostitutes out of a movie or something, you know, out of like Watchmen or, you know, Eyes Wide Shut or something. Like the, the bright colors and like transparent raincoats or like out of Blade Runner, <laughs> you know. And I was like, oh my God, like sex sin and debauchery, you know, it's like, oh. Um, and, uh, and then I remember visiting, you know, a decade later and it had become totally corporatized. Crime was nowhere to be found. I, I remember walking from like doing one of those day walks in Manhattan, which are really fun to do where you just like walk up the Island or down the Island or something, walking from like the Lower East Side, like to Midtown and just it being fine. And then Times Square had become Disney World basically. And it was just pretty incredible. And then. I, I can also remember um, I was doing this program when I was in college. So let's say it's like 2000, year 2000 or something. I think it was, I think it was before 9-11. And um, I remember being in Chelsea and it was like, be, it, it was basically like being in Castro Street in San Francisco or something. I mean, it was unbelievably gay. You, I remember these like after hours, there would be these guys in like muscle shirts and I remember one gay guy like was holding another, his like boyfriend on an actual leash <laughs> while they were walking like down the street. And I was just looking at this like, oh my God, this is out of control. Um, 
And then um, I remember visiting a friend of mine who got an apartment in Chelsea. I remember visiting him, it was like 2000, I don't know, 2010, 2011, you know, a decade later. And all of that was gone. And basically it was finance bros and real estate bros paying like $5,000 a month for 400 square feet or so, just something like that. It was crazy. And yeah, that and is it was exactly. That's, that's crazy. Crazy, crazy. Who could have believed it? You're unusual that you weren't like a conservative movement person. And I, I, I obviously never went through TRS or, or whatever. Just, well, you, 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 were, you, were, you were deep, deep in bed with them in 2016, 17. Yeah, I, well, I wasn't deep, deep in bed with them, but I, um, yeah, in 2016, it was almost like indistinguishable in the sense of like, yeah. it's the alt right, you know? Um, yeah. But, but <clears throat> you spoke to I, Mike Enoch with the same tone and level of agreement as you today speak with Mark Rahman. Wow, tough questions here. This is Richard Spencer being, being grilled on his own Substack uh, subscriber call. So let's get back to the beginning. Like, um, and, I, and I don't know if you guys have, have seen the, uh, uh, someone, you know, re really smart and, uh, you know, cult culturally aware and all of that and saying and, and, and wanting to say, right, you should think about uh, uh, joining this group and here's some books that I'm reading. And yeah, it involves Richard Spencer and they see his article on Wikipedia and we all know what that looks like. Um, and, I, and I don't know if you guys have, have seen the terror in people's eyes. You know, when you talk to a, a friendly person and, uh, you know, a colleague of a, of a dinner, a trusted colleague of a dinner, and you kind of slowly but surely come out as involved in this kind of thing politically and the, 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 the how they freeze as though you've just um, said, look, I'm holding your, your child in the boot of my car right now. It's, it's the same look that, that you get. Um, and, and some, uh, you know... It, it, once once we get a, a great dance, a formal dance of 50 men and 50 ladies, we've already won. <laughs> so Mark Rahman wants to host some formal dances, Greco-Roman dances. Uh, thinks this is, this is the way forward for the dissident right under the aegis of Apolloism. I mean, that is, that's, vic that's victory in the past tense, you know. Once we get 30 men and 30 women, we've almost won. Once we get 50 men and 50 women in a dance in Boston, we've won. That's what that's destination victory. Um, just that you know, the, 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 the difficulty of you know, corralling that, and making it all you know, big enough where so many people have that calendar free and they're all tip top quality. You know, you're talking, you're, you're you know, we, you, that, that is having the same status as a, quite a grand charity ball. Um, where if you went to one, there'd be tons of useless rotten characters there um so yeah o overall i'm interested in kind of the you know the here and now and where we are and what we have what we have to work with right now um do you, kind of in, in, in final summary do you have to go through being a trs type to get to us or is there another way see no, th this is yeah. an interesting question and right. i remember getting in these arguments with people and they would always say well richard you're unusual that you weren't like a conservative movement person and i i, I obviously never went through trs or, or whatever just, well, you, 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 were, you, were, you were deep deep in bed with them in 2016-17 yeah I, well i wasn't deep deep in bed with them but i um yeah in, in 2016 it was almost like indistinguishable in the sense of like yeah. it's the alt right you know um yeah but but <clears throat> you spoke to I, Mike Enoch with the same tone and level of agreement as you today speak with Mark Rahman. Yes, yes, and that that definitely is not going. I, right, things have changed um, yeah. big time. But I also uh, I I never was. I mean, again, due to my age, just to, to a very large extent, I never went through any of that. And I, I see. I would question this because I, I I feel like we're we're going at like well. Is it right to go after these people who we we kind of know what we we know kind of what they're like and what do we offer? I I, I would I would I would say no, and it's go, things are going to be a lot better for us when we are meeting people who haven't gone through them. But they um, they, they they're going to read your Wikipedia page. Well, yeah, but. I mean, so, I don't know. Yeah, but that, that is what it is. I mean, it's, you know, I, I was targeted 
you know, in, in that way. But that just he was targeted. That's kind nothing. of where he didn't we are. Do nothing. He's a and, good and, boy. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, I'm, 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 I know I'm, I'm, I am making our lives difficult almost. I'm, I'm kind of making us face the the reality. But you know, they'll, they'll read Marx. They'll listen to unconscious cinema, and the the word Jew is mentioned poof, thousands of times in that tip top uh, pod, podcast series. Um, so, you know, is is and, and I and I think it's a and I may be wrong here, you know, you guys can school me on this, but I, I think it's okay for people to go through that TRS outlook on, on their way. Yeah. To us. I, I think there's not a huge amount wrong with that. Um, you know, they, if you're going to listen to unconscious cinema, you are, you are going to know what you're listening to. Um, there's just this huge pipeline from TRS to Mark Brahman and uh, former Greco Roman dances and there's a lot of racism and anti-semitism in there and for a bricklayer that is easy to listen to for someone with a lot to lose for some for my colleagues if i would utter those kind of phrases over the dinner table to them they would give me the look of terror in their eyes that i have their kid locked up in a in the boot of my car and was demanding a ransom you know it's it's so you know real and in, the, in, in your face and 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 such it, 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 it so quickly gets down to real terrifying business. Uh, can I say something? Uh -huh. real quick? Yeah. Um, uh, just real quick, like, um, it kind of reminds me of like when, you know, you watch TV and you'll hear like uh, if Joe Biden thought something racial or said something racial uh, at one point. And, uh, you know, the conservatives always think that the Democrats are going to freak out over this, but then they never uh, ever do. And I'm just wondering if maybe it'll be like a, a similar thing here, maybe. Like, you know, they discover, you know, whoever discovers, uh, you know, I think that's that's that might be wishful thinking. It's the 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 landscape we deal with are, is put there by people who control the branding of all of these things. So the branding the branding of the Democrat Party is what it is, and Joe Biden being the leadership of it, and I'm sure he apologized and did all the right things along the way, and just so what's his name, the Prime Minister of Canada, and yeah, and so they are they are blessed and good to go. Um, the, the the branding control for Republicans is a certain way. And the branding control for TRS is a certain way, and we get tainted. Tainted is too loose a word for. I, I know it's yeah. hard, but yeah. and and I I know what we're up against. But I my instinct, you know, coming in was to try to kind of like maybe it was a bit of crypsis, you could say, but it, it was to try to go against the obvious branding, and I, I think. Really effective crepsis, just incredibly effective crepsis, just uh, totally went against the the obvious branding and uh, just just blew people away. They had no idea what he was doing. Incredible. Great job with the crepsis here. We need to do that to a certain extent. I, you know, look, I have made sincere commitments, but, you know, I did muddy the waters a bit by endorsing Joe Biden. Yeah. Yes, and, did. yeah, that was great. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it that was great. Look, and, I, and I didn't That's do it amazing. just to be like cryptic or or totally or mendacious or wow. or befuddling or something. But you know, I, I genuinely did feel like the, the whole Trump thing was so toxic that I just personally wanted out and I just felt like it, it should just end. You know, like it is it is bad, it is leading nowhere and so on. So I still think that. <laughs> um and you know, Democrats are kind of a natural party of government. It's it's it is what it is. But it also does have a little bit of a befuddling quality just to things. Totally where totally threw people. Uh, you know, I I don't know. I think that would just befuddled. Have you noticed all of Richard Spencer's critics just absolutely befuddled? They completely backed off once he endorsed Joe Biden. Might think twice at least. And we don't need to win over the entire professional class. <laughs> you know, as great as that would be. Um, but winning over 2% of them would be fascinating and would be deeply impactful. And yeah. so I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I, this is, I, I, in some ways I'm going on instinct and I'm just, and I'm almost rationalizing it. But my, my instinct tells me that all of that 2016 and 2017 stuff, just let it leads. It's a road that leads to disaster. Playing but I, I, I took that road and I'm not with you. True. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, I took the road too. I mean, I, I can't, I can't like pretend that I didn't make errors, but it, at the same time, like it, 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 if we do that again, like I, I think I've joked about this. Like I've, 
you know, in one of these like multiverse things, like with the Marvel, you know, movies, like where there's like another you in another universe. And okay, I can't, can't take any more. So thank God for being in my high anxiety. I found an article in the New York Times, the right amount of anxiety can improve performance. So anxiety is an uncomfortable emotion fueled by uncertainty. It can create intense, excessive and persistent worry and fear, not just about stressful events, but about everyday situations. There are usually physical symptoms like fast heart rate, muscle tension, rapid breathing, sweating and fatigue. Too much anxiety can be debilitating, but a normal amount is meant to help keep us safe. So the amount of the emotion of anxiety and the underlying, underlying physiological stress response evolved to protect us, says Wendy Suzuki, a neuroscientist and the author of the book Good Anxiety. So managing stress is more useful than banishing it. So increasing amounts of cognitive arousal and stress can improve performance, but only up to a certain point. So when the anxiety is turned up too high, it tends to make you less adept at performing. So the first step in taming anxiety that holds you back is to recognize when you're feeling overly anxious and you try to dial it down. New York Times here. So number one tip is to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. The neurons can slow heart rate, help people feel more calm by deep breathing. It's a very powerful tool to have in your back pocket. So when some dudes try to get in your back pocket, Please activate your parasympathetic nervous system by deep breathing. It's a very powerful tool to have in your back pocket. Deep breathing can take place anytime or anywhere. Physical activity can also help lower anxiety. So a certain degree of anxiety can help people anticipate obstacles, remain cautious, and stay organized. This is from the author of How to Be Yourself, Quiet Your Inner Critic, and Rise Above Social Anxiety. And Anxiety can help you recognize what isn't working. Right? Anxiety is a message. So a lot of the distress we feel with anxiety comes from resistance to it. We're doubling our suffering by being anxious and feeling like, I need to stop feeling anxious. So we're fighting on two fronts. So think of anxiety like a smoke detector. It's a good alarm. Shouldn't be silenced all the time. Accepting anxiety can help you face your fears. So if you find yourself overestimating the risk of something terrible happening, like running into a masturbating man, start by acknowledging your anxiety and looking at it objectively. This is from the author of Show Your Anxiety Who's Boss. Remind yourself that this is the emotional reaction that occurs when you anticipate bad things will happen. It's like your brain is a child throwing a tantrum. Be patient and kind with yourself the way you would be with a friend. This is an opportunity to learn how to accept and tolerate anxiety. So the author of The Upside of Your Dark Side. He, uh, he took up climbing, had a very clear task. I knew I could do it with the anxiety because this expert guy told me he'd done it. People do it. You're going to do it. Anxiety can breed conscientiousness. So anxious people tend to be careful and cautious and conscientious. So this is from the author of The Anxiety Toolkit. Right, when you worry about things that could go wrong, you start making contingency plans, which can help calm your fears and reduce the likelihood of worst case scenarios. So if you create a plan that will help reduce your worries, then follow through. So preparing ahead of time. So these are some of the, the positive aspects of anxiety. Well, oh, another issue is the Foreign Agents Registration Act, the, did he register as a foreign lobbyist? Mm -hmm. You know, when, 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 when they did that against the Trump people, Robert everybody Wright. said this is a chicken shit charge. You know, you don't prosecute people for the failing to register as a lobbyist. So it should be a chicken shit charge for Biden, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there may be something more. I just don't know. He, his, uh, one of his baby mamas was testified, and the Hunter baby mama Biden. lawyer said he thought Biden was going to be indicted. But maybe it was just after publicity. I don't know. Hmm. Well, He's an artist now. Hunter is? Yeah. Well, good. You know, so is President Bush. They should get together. I think Hunter is better. Can't imagine that. Uh, so I had a point about my point left over from uh, of the regular podcast. Not civil uh, service reform. No, is when 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 Zelensky got all sorts of praise for putting his opponent under house arrest and shutting down three TV stations who were broadcasting pro-Putin stuff. The headline in foreign policy is Ukraine's president finally flexes his muscles. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's a certain amount of contempt for the ordinary workings of uh, free speech in that headline. And my point is that all these things that we sort of tried out in Ukraine 
get translated to here. The most obvious one is, uh, you know, we practiced uh, a coup in the Maidan in, I guess, 2014 that sort of worked, except uh, Trump it prompted Putin to invade Ukraine. But we, you know, there was an elected president, and he was undermined by agitation and uh, uh, eventually fled in fear of his life. And uh, a new president was installed, not quite in accordance with the Ukrainian constitution. And it was, a, and and this is basically a parallel to impeachment of Trump. They had a president they didn't like. Exactly the same people who did the thing in Ukraine tried to do the same thing to Trump in the United States. You mean, it's you like mean the, same, the same kind of people? Oh, you mean by, no, by the, the Ukraine lobby, the 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 the, the, the uh, interagency consensus that was all behind the Maidan was also all behind Vindman, uh, you know, Charamelli or whoever the whistleblower was. All those people were uh, were the same people who were supported the Maidan, uh, supporting getting rid of Trump, even though it wasn't democratic because it's for a higher good. So there was the same people here. You suppress. You suppress voices you don't like, you think are pro-Putin and foreign, and a different cast of characters in America, Mitt Romney, Joy Reid, uh, you know, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, are all for like sending Tucker Carlson to prison uh, in the United States. Uh, it's a little harder case to make, but the, it is contagious. The, you know, this, this idea that uh, it, it must be very, it must taste, it must be a real taste of power when you suppress speech. And you get used to it and decide, hey, I'll flex my muscles in the United States. Hmm. Time for Facebook and Twitter to flex their muscles. Uh, I hadn't thought of that connection. Anyway, that's, I, I meant to say that in the regular podcast and I did it's a good, it's a good riff. Uh, it is weird. I mean, I, you know, as you know, I've gotten more and more kind of hopeless about, uh, human beings and I God forbid, God forbid. So the so-called newsroom at the Washington post is melting down tonight, not because the staff collectively realized, Hey, we're in dishonorable dead end jobs funded by a billionaire to attack his political enemies. And therefore we should probably quit. On the basis of our conscience, no, they haven't figured that out. No, they're upset because one of the paper's reporters, a thoroughly beta character called Dave Weigel, retweeted a joke. Now, here it is. Before we read it, we do want to warn you, this is a joke. It's not the result of some longitudinal study. It's a joke. Here's the joke. Every girl is bi. You just have to figure out if it's polar or sexual. <laughs> well, another reporter at The Post, Felicia Somnez, flipped out and publicly demanded that Dave Weigel should be punished for liking the joke. And of course, the Post caved and issued the statement from Matea Gold, the managing editor or something, said, we won't tolerate this. And they suspended poor Dave Weigel with pay. He has so little dignity that he didn't resign. He's just waiting at home on Xbox to get back into the Post newsroom. What's amazing is that Dave Weigel previously defended the same reporter who got all mad when she was in trouble for a tweet about Kobe Bryant. Whoa, what a story. We wanted to get to the bottom of this. We want to talk to the man who wrote this dangerous, unauthorized, cruel and insensitive joke against oppressed women, Cam Harless. And we found him and he joins us now. Cam, did you know that you would wreck a man's career with this joke when you wrote it? I, I didn't know that, but if I had known I'd done it, I probably would have done it earlier, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> It was an unintended benefit. Now, when you wrote this joke, <laughs> did you mean to attack with verbal violence and dehumanize half the population of the United States? Well, not, not, not no. I, uh, when I, so I was, I was, I was talking to some friends in, in, yeah, in a group chat, and someone said this, and it was the first time I'd heard it. Apparently, this is an old joke, something from the yeah. 90s. Um, but this is the first time I heard it, and I chuckled, and I thought, I'm going to tweet that. It's the first day of Pride, Pride Month. Why not see what happens? I thought 30, 30 uh, likes, right? I think I'm at like 12 and a half thousand now, and I never expected that I could help okay some uh very sad news an inspiration to the community atlanta rapper troubled killed at 34. i'll never forget where i was when i heard that trouble was was killed he was fatally shot in georgia at just age 34. his real name was mariel cementor or he was shot at an apartment while visiting a female friend he was found on the ground at 3.20 a.m. Sunday, pronounced dead at the scene. So apparently it was a domestic situation. And uh, this guy built his image in Atlanta. He collaborated on Young Thug's Thief in the Night. So one of the most popular songs from Thug's mixtape, Slime Season 2. Super classic, Rest in Paradise Trouble, wrote LeBron James. He also landed his biggest Billboard hit, reaching number 70 on the Hot 100 for his work on YFN Lucci's song, Key to the Streets. 
He released his debut studio album, Edgewood, in 2018. Over rattling production from super producer Mike Will Made It, Trouble drawed his street tales, bringing them to life in the 37-minute short film that accompanied the album. Happy to be able to have met you, laugh with you, make history with you, and give you a real opportunity you deserved. Mike Will Made It wrote Sunday on Instagram, still one of my favorite rappers out the city. Rest easy, Brody. Trouble's death came just a few short days after another tragedy within the Atlanta hip-hop community. Producer Metro Boomin's mother, Leslie Joanne Wayne, was killed by her husband, who then killed himself. Metro Boomin had produced songs for Drake, Travis Scott, and The Weeknd. Boomin recalled the times his mum drove to then-unknown producer... Fader, 17 hours to meet Atlanta rapper OJ the Juice Man, believing in him all the way so long as he maintained his spot on the school's honor roll. Wow, so much loss from some of our greatest artists. I mean, these people are just absolute inspirations to, to the community. I mean, taken from us way too soon, we will... We will not see the so the Washington again. Post is a hellish place to work, but it's one of many. It turns out that there are a lot of sinister people in workplaces all over the country, particularly in big companies, and almost all of them work in the HR department. Here's a video from Canada showing an actual human resources executive informing the Ottawa truckers and their supporters that they can never work again because she holds the key to their future. <laughs> Watch this. Looking at you freedom fighters, freedom fighters, um, we always had freedom, you know, the charters and rights and freedom that would tell you that. But since you seem to forget that and you're all loud and proud with your big thoughts and your big, big ideas and you want to whatever, set up hot tubs in Ottawa. I'm a recruiter. So if you're looking for a job or maybe trying to keep a job, maybe, just maybe, think about what you're putting on social media. Recruiters are watching. HR is watching everywhere. And we hate you. <laughs> so even if you're not religious, even if you're an atheist, you'll have to concede that's satanic. Candace Owens is the founder of the charity Blexit. She wow. joins us tonight. Hey, Candace. Hey, that, Candace. That's, that's the person in control of your future. What is it about TikTok that brings out these adult mental yes, illnesses? I can't yes. figure it out. What is it about this app? Okay. Matt Drudge loves Matt Labash. So Matt Labash constantly gets uh, gets linked from, from Matt Drudge. And uh, Labash has an essay on how the, the news is driving you mad. So let me get to that. That people that are mentally unstable go on it and must say, hi, I am a crazy person and listen to me speak about these issues. By the way, is this the weirdest flex ever? I'm a HR recruiter and I'm going to be able to control your entire life. Like she's bonkers. She's out of her mind. But she's also mm. so emblematic of the West increasingly having this issue with mental illness just fully yes. on display. And we're yes. pretending that it's not everywhere around us. She's angry because people like freedom. She's using the word freedom like it's a dirty word. We're going to find you. We know you like to be free. We know you like to breathe without a mask. You know you like to have control over your own body and not be forced vaccinated by your government. We know you like to move across state lines without your government telling you no. And I'm an HR recruiter. <laughs> okay, Matt Labash talks about how the news is very bad for you. Anger management, how the news is destroying us. Newsflash, the news is it destroying us. It's uh, where you choose to consume, how much you consume, right? Our problems are not outside of us, right? It's not the news that is destroying us. So Matt Labesh says, there's plenty of good news out there, but a hard reality of the news trade is that ratings and clicks don't get generated for the most part by telling an audience how there are all these good things going on in the world. Therefore, bad news doesn't just exist. It becomes amplified out of proportion of the frequency with which it actually occurs. Plenty of bad news has also been fabricated and, and goosed. Right. Fair enough. But uh, people get to choose the live streams they watch. They get to choose the TV shows they watch. They get to choose the newspapers they watch. So for me, I usually wait a couple of hours, 
when I when I get up in the morning before I consume some news, and then I do it by reading the LA Times, Steve Saylor, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, some ESPN, and The Athletic, and uh, doesn't really seem to bring me down. So I often uh, read the news again in the in the evening. I probably spend an hour a day reading newspapers. Doesn't uh, doesn't really seem to uh, destroy my life. So. Greg Abbott, uh, George Abbott, longtime theater producer, director, playwright, says in the first act, you get your hero up a tree. The second act, you throw rocks at him. For the third act, you let him down. Plenty of storytellers these days just stop at the second act. Let's throw rocks. And the overstimulation of our aggressive impulses tends to warp our perceptions the same way Twitter addicts tend to think Twitter is all that matters. Look, these are just reflections of deeper problems inside of people, right? Twitter is not driving us mad. The news isn't driving us mad. It's people's irresponsible use, right? Same with guns or alcohol or, or gambling. Like I'm not a fan of gambling, but most people who gamble probably gamble responsibly. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people who own guns use them responsibly. So I don't think that the news is driving us mad. I think people who are mad may look for reasons to exacerbate why they're mad. They want to they want to amp it up and uh, they want to get that adrenaline rush that uh, things are really terrible. But the problem is not the news. The problem is not in our stars, but in our souls. One time says holiness expresses itself almost exclusively with the exception of the eternally and generally valid moral laws and laws of separation. That is Kashra separated all you know, all sorts of things that we divide ourselves so from. Mark the How often is the Jew told you show you must not do this or that in the same manner of other peoples? For you are a holy people until the eternal your God. We still hear this today. We're told that the so this is Mark Shapiro, his series on the rise of Reform Judaism and the Orthodox rabbinic response. So he's talking about a 19th century German Reform rabbi Samuel Hordheim and his justifications for abandoning the, the ritual laws of Judaism. And so when you talk to non-Orthodox Jews, they talk about the reasons for kosher or often health, or they'll come up with any number of reasons, but you talk to Orthodox Jews and they'll recognize that uh, reasons for kosher, one, you don't know, two, it's just God's directive, but three, probably the most common response is that it separates you from other people. So Jews have survived as a distinctive culture, living as a minority for approximately 2,500 years. And the way you do that is by continually reinforcing to your group how your group is awesome as compared to the majority group. So the way any minority culture sustains itself is by reinforcing to itself over and over and over again how the majority do X, but we do Y. The majority think this, but we think that. Now, this can come with some downsides. You can take it too seriously. So a low level to moderate level of thinking that the majority is stupid and your in-group is just totally awesome serves you. But you get too intense with your out-group hostility and it's destructive for you. It's destructive for the people that you interact with. And it's destructive for your in-group because nobody really wants to tolerate minorities who loathe them. Jewish people have a special role. We can't do that. That's what the non-Jews do. He continues, if, you, if one searches after the reason for most of the ceremonial laws of the Bible, one will find that they will give in only because of the existence of pagan peoples. So the re reform perspective is that even if God gave the Torah every word of it 3,200 years ago, that does not necessarily mean it is still in effect today. So from, from a reform perspective, yeah, God may have given these laws for, for Jews to practice 3,200 years ago, but now times have changed. Not all these laws are binding on us anymore. And how does their purpose separation from these peoples? Now, that's what he assumes. And he has good authority. That's what the Rambam says. The Rambam, all these things, even things like shotness, it's all to keep us away from the, uh, the, the practices of the pagans because they would do this, the pagan priests would do this. But the, 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 the Torah itself doesn't say this, and the Gemara doesn't say this. This is the Rambam's approach. Uh, there's no reason uh, to be bound to that, that already uh, Rav Shamsha Rav Al-Hirsch 
And others criticize the Rambam uh, for the way they look at uh, the, the commandments. In fact, uh, Hirsch thinks that uh, this gives uh, strength to the reformer. So the Rambam, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, he, he lived in the 12th and 13th century. He said that th there are rational reasons for all of Jewish law. So he was heavily influenced by Greek philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and he tried to rationalize Judaism. And by so doing, he strengthened Judaism in the sense of making it seem you know, intellectually powerful and coherent in the face of, of uh, the rise of uh, Greek philosophy, renewal of Greek philosophy in the Islamic and Christian worlds. At the same time, he then, by rationalizing Judaism, once people think they understand the reasons for the laws, they often become less likely to practice the laws. And so he inadvertently helped lay the groundwork for secularism. So you often see this trend in religion. You have religious precepts laid down by God, and then people come along later on and rationalize those precepts, saying, oh, they, they make sense just on their own. And then once you rationalize the religion, you're often a short step from watering it down and moving into a secular outlook. Because if these are reasons for the commandments, this is where you're going to let you, just like whole time. Uh, he says, we must admit, therefore, that these laws would either not have been given at all or would have been given differently had the Jewish people been the only people in the world and had other people or human beings not exist at all. So he says, since all these ritual laws are, are there to keep us away from the non-Jews and their immoralities, had the Jewish people been the only people in the world um, or had, uh, had they, they been the only people, then these wouldn't have been commanded. There wouldn't have been these commandments, the reasons of which are to keep us away from the non-Jews because there aren't non-Jews in the world. There is only one reason, he says, for Israel's ceremonial law, and that is the holiness of the Jewish people in relation to other peoples. That is its choice from amongst these other nations. That is the point of this, is to make us a holy people, a special people, in contrast to the other nations. But if the other nations didn't exist, we wouldn't need for this. Uh, then he says, this may be compared with the holiness of the priestly tribe, that is the Kohanim. The Kohanim, the, it's the election from all the tribes of Israel for especially sacred service is the reason for their respective priestly laws. We have all the laws about the Kohanim because they're separate. But if So one of the first things I learned about how to operate within a synagogue is figuring out which strata you, you belong to. They're the Kohanim, the, the priests, the, the Levites who, who assist in the temple rites, and then there's Yisraelim. So no longer a lot of special roles for Levites and priests, but they still get called to the Torah in a, in a special order as a convert. I am just uh, Yisrael, just, uh, just a regular Jew. So this is yeah. so Leah was, Greenfeld on the history of nationalism. It's a collectivistic nationalism. So uh, in, uh, well, in England, Britain, the United States, all those individualistic nations, Australia, Australia, all the nations in the so-called Anglo world. Nationalism led to institutions of liberal democracy, majoritarian democracy, where the majority of individuals decided on everything. Institutions that safeguarded individual rights in the first place, where nationalism developed as a collectivistic nationalism there always was a very strong authoritarian tendency and the democracy developed institutions democratic institutions developed as those of authoritarian democracy with a certain political elite divining the will the general will you know yeah. and the interests of the nation irrespective of what the majority of the individuals thought so you have first individualistic nationalism and collectivistic nationalism mm. i think you, you pretty much uh, sorry yeah, go on. now individualistic nationalism logically defines criteria of membership 
in the nation, that is nationality, on a voluntaristic basis. One's national identity cannot be imposed on an individual, but should be voluntarily assumed, freely chosen, and can be abandoned. So as a result, for example, anyone can become an American, a member of the nation, acquire. So I just read Leah Greenfield in the Wall Street Journal. She had an op-ed last week saying that the more freedom you have in a society, the more mental illness, because many people can't deal well with the burdens of freedom, because in a free society, you are going to be very liable to the emotion of envy. That's the, the dominant emotion of a free society and so the freer the country is the more mental illness and so the united states has long been about the freest country in the world and so it's had the most mental illness but she traces all this to the growth of nationalism it says with the rise of a national consciousness in 16th century england that you had accompanying that a rise in human dignity that uh, went to all strata of society not just the aristocrats but to the people. So it used to be the people, that, that term just meant the plebs. But starting with the rise of nationalism in England in the 16th century, the people came to, to mean something more positive, that all people were worthy of dignity and that all people composed a collective identity, a consciousness known as the nation. And so there was a growth in human dignity, then a growth in freedom and democracy but with this freedom came a burden of trying to construct one's life because the more freedom you have, then the more choices you have to make and that there are more ways that you can go wrong, the more ways you can make a total jerk of yourself and then you're more likely to feel bad. There's no longer a catch if you fall. You can just keep falling, 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 making terrible choices and then the worse you're going to feel about yourself. American nationality. Right. And one can also lose American nationality. If one doesn't want to be American, here I go, goodbye, and that's it. Now, I, I, think, yeah. you, I think you pretty much answered this question already, but I'm going to answer it another way. What is, is nationalism dangerous, as we, or is it mis just misunderstood because of history has interpreted it the wrong way? Is but it as dangerous? Again, Right. Uh, is nationalism misunderstood in today's society, or is it as dangerous as some people make it out to believe it is? Well, let me first finish what I am yep. telling you. So you have the type of individualistic and civic nationalism, as in the Anglo world, where nationality is equated with citizenship. You see? Mm -hmm in collectivistic and this is a necessary necessary equation because it is voluntary membership in the nation is voluntary but in collectivistic nationalisms there are two possibilities it can be voluntary that is civic as it developed in france for example right that is even though france is a collectivistic nation and it, the nation is defined as a collective individual if you really want to become French, that is, if you adore France and the French language and the French traditions, you're welcome. France is a completely civic nation. From the very beginning, it was very open. But a collectivistic nationalism can also be ethnic. That is, when membership in the nation is not, is not voluntary, but is presumed to be transmitted by blood. That is, you are either born a member of a certain nation, and then you cannot lose it, or you are not born a member of a certain nation, and then you cannot become a member of this nation which right. way the 
collectivistic nationalism takes depends on the cultural achievements and the prestige of the community at the time when nationalism develops. So France was admired by the entire world when its nationalism was developing. They had a very uh, uh, well-developed sense of cultural superiority. Right. And they understood that everyone would want to become French. So whoever wanted, okay, they say, come on in. But countries such as Russia and Germany, when their nationalism was developing, had a deep sense of cultural inferiority. They didn't have anything to be proud of. Not their political system, not their language, not their culture. They didn't have literature. They didn't have, well, they didn't have anything. So, how could they then become a nation and a nation with a dignity? How could they acquire a dignified national identity? Yeah. When they said, well, our virtues, you cannot see, you know, unlike mm -hmm. the French virtues, for example, which are all external, our virtues are natural. The reflection of our blood and soil. Yeah. And so the concept of ethnicity emerged, which is basically the concept of race. And both Russia and Germany developed collectivistic ethnic nationalism. Now, fascism is an expression of collectivistic civic nationalism because this is what both italy and spain developed those are movements of italy and spain and they had a very considerable sense of cultural superiority because of their connection well because of their history in general uh, in italy because of their connection to uh, the roman empire that was a very big thing to be proud of and in Did Spain, the Romans have a form of nationalism? No, they had sense? none. They had none. But of course, nationalists immediately start looking into history for the contents of their nationalism. Right. You know, they project their nationalism into history. Romans had no nationalism, absolutely none. But Italians who lived there where Rome was, you know, mm -hmm. This is how they understand themselves. So they were very superior. And uh, the same Spain, Spain was of course a very great power uh, for a long time before nationalism. So they also uh, didn't have any sense of inferiority, both in, uh, France, in uh, Italy and in Spain, nationalism was collectivistic, but civic. And of course, the horror of Nazism of national socialism mm -hmm. was its racism. So it is a bad mistake to uh, confuse fascism with national socialism. Did the Nazis ruin the reputation of nationalism in a way that, that they made it yes, a bad they reputation? Did. They did, they did, they did. Yes, they did. They gave it a very bad name. So is that, why, is that why we think that nationalists, a lot of people think that nationalism, do you immediately have to be, if I said that I was, I'm not, not that I'm saying I am, but like if I said I was a nationalist, then they immediately think, oh, you must be a racist because you are, you are a nationalist and you are. Uh, she, she makes the point that, uh, that I've never heard before, that Nazism was not fascism because fascism was not racist. And that because the, 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 the Nazis were racist, therefore they couldn't be fascist. So I hadn't heard that argument. This is... Uh, in any society, let's say we're speaking about England or France, any society, but there was no inclusive identity. The nobility could not identify with the people. The people could not identify with the nobility. Those were exclusive identities within the same society. Now, this new 
redefinition actually created an inclusive identity. So a completely new consciousness appeared, a new view of reality. And this consciousness was the national consciousness, simply because of the word nation that was used. <coughs> this was a new view of reality. Now reality was imagined, instead of being imagined, as um, three different orders. Now it was imagined as consisting the world, as consisting of sovereign communities of fundamentally equal members. Because the entire people <clears throat> was now an elite. The elite represented the authority in uh, their society so that the entire people was where the authority happened, where what was the locus of authority. Such communities of fundamentally equal members were called in English that was emerging at that time because English of the 15th century was a very different English. Modern English was only emerging with this new consciousness. And so such societies, that is a fundamentally equal sovereign community, was called an English nation. That's why we're talking about nationalism. This is what nationalism is. Nationalism is the framework of modernity. It is the cultural framework of modernity, the consciousness on which anything that is modern rests. So we are all nationalists because we all have national consciousness. We think, we see the universe through this lens. And our existential experience as a result is determined by nationalism. It would take too long to talk about all the implications of nationalism. They are colossal, as I already said. I mean, our entire existence is the product of this consciousness. But let's just talk about the most important ones of them. The definition of the people as an elite, that is the definition of the people and the nation, the equation of those two terms, makes people an object of loyalty, it creates a dignified, inclusive identity. Obviously, this identity is now dignified. Everyone is a member of an elite, of an elite and a sovereign community. Necessarily implies egalitarianism, popular sovereignty. There is fundamental equality between all the members of the nation and the community as sovereign. And most importantly, it endows the personal identity of every member of a nation with dignity. This is really a colossal change in the existential experience of humanity. Before nationalism, dignity was the property, the experience of very narrow upper strata. Only the nobility basically had dignity. The lot of the people, of the regular people, was humility and abnegation. So here's some of Leah Greenfeld's books. She's a professor. Mind, Modernity, Madness, The Impact of Culture and Human Experience. Came out in 2013. I'm reading it now. The Spirit of Capitalism, Nationalism and Economic Growth. Nationalism, Five Roads to Modernity. Nationalism, A Short History. And Nationalism and the Mind, Essays on Modern Culture. They were not respected. They did not respect themselves. This simply was not a part of the experience. But now dignity becomes the experience of every member of the nation. Now, dignity is a very pleasant experience. I can even make an experiment right now and ask you, all of you, to imagine a moment when you felt dignified. For example, you got uh, a prize, you know, uh, for something, or 
you published an article or a book, or you got accepted into a nice university, right? Now just imagine that. What you are feeling, I know that I made this experiment many times, you're all feeling the same physical sensation. Your chest expands. You become taller. You feel there is more air in your lungs. It is, a rem and then imagine, you can also imagine the experience of humiliation. Also can remember something. An experience humiliation is an extremely physically unpleasant sensation. So the moment people acquired the possibility of this experience of <clears throat> dignity, this experience became addictive, like a drug. And so after that, nobody would give it up. This is the reason for the extraordinary appeal of nationalism. This is the reason why, beginning in a small island at a certain time by accident, when it became available, it spread all around the world. In addition, what are the implications of uh, nationalism? Freedom of choice, the emergence of the very idea of individual as an autonomous agent. You mentioned Durkheim. Durkheim says in the, um, in the division of labor in society that it is modern society that invents the individual. And he has his explanation, which is not very convincing. But indeed, the individual is invented by society. Modern society is the society created by nationalism. And this is why modern society creates the individual. Before that, this sort of idea did not exist. And therefore, such individuals did not exist. And then, Nationalism replaces God by man as the maker of man. Because freedom of choice implies that everyone now can make oneself. You decide what you want to be in life. You are not there where you are being put by your birth. No, you are in control of your fate, of your destiny. At the same time, God is replaced by the people as the bearer of sovereignty. So even though this doesn't have to be explicit, nobody has to formulate that, nationalism is a fundamentally secular form of consciousness. It is completely focused on this world. And now people, remarkably, they who would die for God. This happened throughout history, certainly throughout Christian history. Now suddenly, they would die and they would kill for the nation. So basically, the nation replaces God. This means, among other things, this is also an obvious implication of nationalism, that nationalism means democracy. If you subscribe to <coughs> democracy, you are a nationalist. It, it just cannot be otherwise. Every nation is a democracy by definition. However, there are different types of nationalism. Nationalism is not an homogeneous phenomenon. And as a result, there are different types of democracy. Nationalism emerges in England as an individualistic consciousness. Why? Because the very experience that it was called on to explain was the experience of individuals. It was those individuals who were upwardly mobile. Now, when the nation itself is imagined as a composite entity, as an association of individuals, nationalism would be individualistic. The membership of the nation in an individualistic nation would necessarily be voluntary. 
the individual who doesn't want to belong to the nation would not belong to the nation. So, actually, nationality, the membership in the nation, would be the same as citizenship, as accepting certain duties within a community and with those duties also accepting various rights. This was English nationalism. But when the nation is imagined as a collective individual, the interesting thing is that in the English of uh, that early period, I mean the language of that early period, and this was so through the entire 18th century uh, American English, the nation is a plural noun. So the pronouns that correspond to the nation and to the people are the pronouns we and they. Some of you may uh, know how the uh, Constitution of the United States begins, we the people. But already in France, the nation acquires its own individuality. That is, it becomes a collective individual. And we no longer refer to those nations the same, of course, is true about Russia. We no longer refer to uh, these nations in the plural. We refer to them in the singular, and very often in personal singular as she or he, mostly she. But the people would be he, you know. Uh, so when you imagine the nation as uh, a collective individual, that would be a collectivistic nationalism. Why? Because as a collective individual, it would have its own will and its own interests. And those will and interests would no longer depend on the wills and interests of the majority of the individuals. That's why you would have this different from majoritarian democracy. Majoritarian democracy is necessarily an individualistic nationalism. But then you, when you have a collectivistic nationalism, there must be somebody. It doesn't matter what the majority of individuals think. Those majority of individuals, they like cells in an organism. We pitilessly cut our own nails because we don't care how those nails feel when we, when we cut them, right? Those are just cells that are not very useful for our organism that, uh, when they grow too long. And so individual rights are not that very important. Individual lives are not that very important. Individual, individuals can be sacrificed at any moment when it serves the good and the will and the interests of the nation. And then you have to have necessarily an elite that would um, decipher, divine the will and the interests of the nation. And as a result, you have a natural aristocracy that emerges in collectivistic nationalisms. And this is so whether the membership of the nation is still voluntary, as was the situation in France, as is the situation in France, even now, or when it is defined as a biological necessity, which is the situation in ethnic nations, such, for example, as Germany or as Russia. In any case, individualistic nationalisms produce liberal democracy. They produce institutions that safeguard the rights of individuals collectivistic nationalisms, whether they are civic or ethnic, tend to produce authoritarian democracies. But they're nevertheless democracies. So uh, this is very important to understand. Authoritarian democracies are no less <coughs> democracies than, uh, than individualistic democracies, because everything is done in them <coughs> for the people, by the people, because the uh, authority of the people is always recognized and uh, um, because the people are considered fundamentally equal. What is important is that despite, um, despite these types and differences, the existential experience in nations and in democracies, therefore in democracies, is very similar no matter what type they are. So, dignity is the core of, moral, of, of modern experience. It is the source of the appeal of nationalism, 
and it is the source of all political conflicts between and within nations. So whenever there are conflicts in the modern world, it all will be about dignity and not anything else. So for example... Okay, coming near the end here. Not economics. Economics would not provoke conflicts, great conflicts. But here we have... <clears throat> We arrive at a moment when, in fact, we need another very important concept. And um, this, is, this is where um, I begin a new project, and I want to share it with you. We must introduce here the concept of civilization. Its importance, the importance of the concept of civilization, is only now, that is, in the last two decades, is becoming clear. People were bandying the word around, of course, but it didn't mean anything much, and uh, it didn't contribute anything to our understanding of reality. Now it is becoming clear that it is a very important concept, and that it actually does contribute something very important to our understanding of reality. <clears throat> it is becoming clear because of the surprising and sudden rise of China. We are only now discovering China, and we are discovering it at once. And yet it always existed. Of course it existed on the borders of Russia for, you know, for as long as basically Russia as we know it exists, and yet we never noticed it. Um, we never noticed it in the same way as, uh, as we never, we do not notice the moon. You know, it also exists constantly, and so it is observed but not seen. It is like there, but it doesn't matter. And suddenly it emerged, China, not the moon, but China as some sort of volcanic explosion, and it changed our world. We already know that it has changed our world. It just happened within our living memory. I would say that <clears throat> we didn't notice it certainly before the Beijing Olympics of 2008. We're talking about a decade. And now already, when I arrived in Pulkova, everything is in Chinese. It's quite amazing. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, I remember um, Chadaev, who wanted Russia to convert to, to Catholicism because he wanted so much Russia to be a Western, a European state. And he said, well, of course, I, I'm just quoting from memory in one of his letters of the one for which he was declared a madman. But this passage, nobody noticed. He said, well, of course it is Europe from which we have to, uh, which we have to imitate and from which we can derive all the important examples for us. Would anyone think that such examples could come from the East, from Japan or China? This would be an absolute abomination. But the, the, there was such contempt for the East among Russian intelligentsia. But of course, not only from uh, Russian intelligence. I mean, we, we know this, I mean, this is how it was. Another example would be Kimpling, right? So uh, the, this was the attitude. As if the sun was rising actually in the West and not the other uh, way around. And now we suddenly discovered it. And discovering China, we realize that there is another major level, at least I realized, that there is another major level of difference behind the level of specific nations. Of course, France and England are different. But they look completely like twins when you compare them. 
to that other place, that other thing, that other world. So behind the level of specific nations, behind different types of nationalism, and even behind the difference between pre-national and national consciousness. This is the highest level of difference, the highest level where humanity forks, branches out into separate cultural traditions. And those separate cultural traditions create different psychological dynamics. And those different psychological dynamics, basically they create different minds. Our brains are the same, but the minds can be truly different, which means the way of thinking and the way of feeling. So, the remarkable thing is that in our civilization, which I call, I mean, from the point of view of China, it is called the West. Uh, when we use the word, the, the phrase Western civilization, we usually exclude from it um, Islam, and very often we exclude from it Eastern Christianity too, so Russia is not included. Well, uh, what is the West for China? I would say, and that's why I prefer to use this phrase, it is monotheistic civilization. It is civilization embedded in the three monotheistic uh, religions. So nationalism, when it emerged for a very long time, uh, and certainly <coughs> until the end of the 19th century, it spread only within the monotheistic civilization. And within the only exception was Japan, and I will speak about that. And within its original civilization, the experience of dignity has been tightly connected to the experience of equality. So that whenever we feel ourselves treated unequally with somebody else, it is our dignity that suffers. Which is, presupp which is based on the presupposition of fundamental equality between all those nations and all those individuals within those nations. A presupposition to which comparability and actual comparison is essential. In Russia, in particular, this is very, very constantly clear that Russia feels, Russian nationalists, Russians feel humiliated if they're not treated as equals to the Western nations. They feel that their dignity suffers from that. The experience of inequality, therefore a threat to one's dignity, gives rise to existential envy, which may lead to what Nietzsche called resentiment, that is very deep, resentment that is constantly re-experienced, that foments constantly, and as a result produces very hateful ideologies and aggression. <coughs> and this can happen on the collective and on individual levels. This means that envy is a central psychological factor in our civilization. A central psychological factor that accompanies nationalism in our civilization. The very corollary of the preoccupation with dignity. When you have this preoccupation with dignity, there is envy somewhere very close. So let me perhaps um, before we move forward. Okay, that's uh, Professor Leah Greenfeld speaking there in 2018. There are a lot of videos of her on YouTube. She's the author of Mind, Modernity, Madness, The Impact of Culture and Human Experience. She's written a bunch of books on nationalism, including The Spirit of Capitalism, Nationalism and Economic Growth, Nationalism, Five Roads to Modernity, Nationalism, A Short History. And she edited Nationalism and the Mind, Essays on Modern Culture. 
watching Borgen on Netflix. So five years later, they've come out with a new se season of uh, Borgen. It's a, about a female politician in Denmark. And uh, this season is all about uh, Greenland. So that's it for tonight. Take care. Bye-bye. I'll be back with more crowd-pleasing populist entertainment soon.